Section 18 of The Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corinne LePage. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Section 16 Vegetable Life and Work. Parts 1 to 4. The following simple outlines of the anatomy and physiology of plants are added to the preceding structural part for the better preparation of students in descriptive and systematic botany, also to give all learners some general idea of the life, growth, intimate structure, and action of the beings which compose so large a part of organic nature. Those who would extend and verify the facts and principles here outlined will use the physiological botany of the botanical textbook by Professor Goodale, or some similar book. 1. Anatomical Structure and Growth Growth is the increase of a living thing in size and substance. It appears so natural that plants and animals should grow that one rarely thinks of it as requiring explanation. It seems enough to say that a thing is so because it grew so, Growth from the seed, the germination and development of an embryo into a plantlet, and at length into a mature plant, as illustrated in sections 2 and 3, can be followed by ordinary observation, but the embryo is already a miniature plantlet, sometimes with hardly any visible distinction of parts, but often one which has already made very considerable growth in the seed. To investigate the formation and growth of the embryo itself requires well-trained eyes and hands, and the expert use of a good compound microscope, so this is beyond the reach of a beginner. Moreover, although observation may show that a seedling weighing only two or three grains may double its bulk and weight every week of its early growth, and may in time produce a huge amount of vegetable matter, it is still to be asked what this vegetable matter is where it came from, and by what means plants are able to increase and accumulate it, and build it up into the fabric of herbs and shrubs and lofty trees. Protoplasm. All this fabric was built up under life, but only a small portion of it is at any one time alive. As growth proceeds, life is passed on from the old to the new parts, much as it is passed on from parent to offspring, from generation to generation in unbroken continuity. Protoplasm is the common name of that plant stuff in which life essentially resides. All growth depends on it, for it has the peculiar power of growing and multiplying and building up a living structure, the animal no less than the vegetable structure, for it is essentially the same in both. Indeed, all the animal protoplasm comes primarily from the vegetable, which has the prerogative of producing it, and the protoplasm of plants furnishes all that portion of the food of animals which forms their flesh and living fabric. The very simplest plants, if such may specifically be called plants rather than animals, or one may say the simplest living things, are mere particles or pellets or threads or even indefinite masses of protoplasm of vague form, which possesses powers of motion or of changing their shape, of imbibing water, air, and even other matters, and of assimilating these into plant stuff for their own growth and multiplication. Their growth is increase in substance by incorporation of that which they take in and assimilate. Their multiplication is by spontaneous division of their substance or body in two or more, each capable of continuing the process. The embryo of a phanerogamous plant at its beginning is essentially such a globule of protoplasm, which soon constricts itself into two or more such globules, which hold together inseparably in a row. Then the last of the row divides without separation in the two other planes to form a compound mass, each grain or globule of which goes on to double itself as it grows, and the definite shaping of this still increasing mass builds up the embryo into its form. Figures 433 to 436. Figures to illustrate the earlier stages in the formation of an embryo, a single mass of protoplasm dividing into two, three, and then into more incipient cells, which by continued multiplication build up an embryo. Cell walls. 
while this growth was going on each grain of the forming structure formed and clothed itself with a coat thin and transparent of something different from the protoplasm something which hardly and only transiently if at all partakes of the life and action the protoplasm forms the living organism the coat is a kind of protective covering or shell the protoplasm like the flesh of animals which it gives rise to is composed of four chemical elements carbon hydrogen oxygen and nitrogen the coating is of the nature of wood is indeed that which makes wood and has only the three elements carbon hydrogen and oxygen in its composition figure 437 magnified view of some of a simple freshwater alga the tetraspora lubrica each sphere of which may answer to an individual plant although the forming structure of an embryo in the fertilized ovule is very minute and difficult to see there are many simple plants of lowest grade abounding in pools of water which more readily show the earlier stages or simplest stages of plant growth one of these which is common in early spring requires only moderate magnifying power to bring to view what is shown in figure 437 in a slimy mass which holds all loosely together little spheres of green vegetable matter are seen assembled in fours and these fours themselves in clusters of fours a transient inspection shows what prolonged watching would confirm that each sphere divides first one plane then in the other to make four soon acquiring the size of the original and so on producing successive groups of fours these pellets each form on their surface a transparent wall like that just described the delicate wall is for some time capable of expansive growth but is from the first much firmer than the protoplasm within through which the later imbibe surrounding moisture which becomes a watery sap occupying vacuities in the protoplasmic mass which enlarge or run together as the periphery increases and distends when full grown the protoplasm may become a mere lining to the wall or some of it central as a nucleus this usually connected with the wall lining by delicate threads of the same substance so when full grown the wall with its lining a vesicle containing liquid or some solid matters and in age mostly air naturally came to be named a cell but the name was suggested by and first used for cells in combination or built up into a fabric much as a wall is built of bricks that is into a cellular structure or tissue suppose numerous cells like those of figure 437 to be heaped up like a pile of cannonballs and as they grew to be compacted together while soft and yielding they would flatten where they touched and each sphere being touched by twelve surrounding ones would become twelve-sided figure 438 would represent one of them suppose the contiguous faces to be united into one wall or partition between adjacent cavities and a cellular structure would be formed like that shown in figure 439 roots stems leaves and the whole of phanerogamous plants are a fabric of countless numbers of such cells no such exact regularity in size and shape is ever actually found but a nearly truthful magnified view of a small portion of a slice of the flower stalk of a calla lily shows a fairly corresponding structure except that owing to the great air spaces of the interior the fabric may be likened rather to a stack of chimneys than to a solid fabric in young and partly transparent parts one may discern the cellular structure by looking down directly on the surface as of a forming root figure 438 diagram of a vegetable cell such as it would be if when spherical it were equally pressed by similar surrounding cells in a heap figure 439 ideal construction of cellular tissue so formed in section figure 440 magnified view of a portion of a transverse slice of stem of a calla lily the great spaces are turbular air channels built up by the cells the substance of which cell walls are mainly composed is called cellulose it is essentially the same in the stem of a delicate leaf or petal and in the wood of an oak except that in the latter the walls are much thickened and the caliber small 
the protoplasm of each living cell appears to be completely shut up and isolated in its shell of cellulose but microscopic investigation has brought to view in many cases minute threads of protoplasm which here and there traverse the cell wall through minute pores thus connecting the living portion of one cell with that of adjacent cells figure four forty one much magnified small portion of young root of a seedling maple such as of figure eighty two and four forty two a few cells of same more magnified the prolongations from the back of some of the cells are root hairs the hairs of plants are cells formed on the surface either elongated single cells like the root hairs of figures four forty one and four forty two or a row of shorter cells cotton fibers are long and simple cells growing from the surface of the seed the size of the cells of which common plants are made up varies from about the thirtieth to the thousandth of an inch in diameter an ordinary size of short or roundish cells is from one three hundredth to one five hundredth of an inch so that there may generally be from twenty seven to one hundred and twenty five millions of cells in the compass of a cubic inch some parts are built up as a compact structure in others cells are arranged so as to build up regular air channels as in the stems of aquatic and other water-loving plants or to leave irregular spaces as in the lower part of most leaves where the cells only here and there come into close contact figure four forty three magnified section through the thickness of a leaf of florida star anise all such soft cellular tissue like this of leaves that of pith and of the green bark is called parenchyma while fibrous and woody parts are composed of presenchyma that is of peculiarly transformed strengthening cells common cellular tissue which makes up the whole structure of all very young plants and the whole of mosses and other vegetables of the lowest grade even when full grown is too tender or too brittle to give needful strength and toughness for plants which are to rise to any considerable height and support themselves in these needful strength is imparted and the conveyance of sap through the plant is facilitated by the change as they are formed of some cells into thicker walled and tougher tubes and by the running together of some of these or the prolongation of others into hollow fibres or tubes of various size two sorts of such transformed cells go together and essentially form the wood this is found in all common herbs as well as in shrubs and trees but the former have much less of it in proportion to the softer cellular tissue it is formed very early in the growth of the root stem and leaves traces of it appearing in large embryos even while yet in the seed those cells that lengthen and at the same time thicken their walls form the proper woody fibre or wood cells those of larger size and thinner walls which are thickened only in certain parts so as to have peculiar markings and which often are seen to be made up of a row of cylindrical cells with the partitions between absorbed or broken away are called ducts or sometimes vessels there are all gradations between wood cells and ducts and between both these and common cells but in most plants the three kinds are fairly distinct figure four forty four magnified wood cells of the bark bast cells of basswood one and part of another figure four forty five some wood cells from the wood and below part of a duct and four forty six a detached wood cell of the same equally magnified figure four forty seven some wood cells of buttonwood platanus highly magnified a whole cell and lower end of another on the left a cell cut halfway lengthwise and half of another on the right some pores or pits a seen on the left while b b mark sections through these on the cut surface when living and young the protoplasm extends into these and by minuter perforations connects across them in age the pits become open passages facilitating the passage of sap and air the proper cellular tissue or parenchyma is the groundwork of root stem and leaves this is traversed chiefly lengthwise by the strengthening 
and conducting tissue wood cells and duct cells in the form of bundles or threads which in the stems and stalks of herbs are fewer and comparatively scattered but in shrubs and trees so numerous and crowded that in the stems and all permanent parts they make a solid mass of wood they extend into and ramify in the leaves spreading out in a horizontal plane as the framework of ribs and veins which support the softer cellular portion or parenchyma wood cells or woody fibers consist of tubes commonly between one and two thousandths but in pine wood sometimes two or three hundredths of an inch in diameter those from the tough bark of the basswood shown in figure 444 are only the fifteen hundredth of an inch wide those of button wood are larger and are here highly magnified besides the figures show the way wood cells are commonly put together namely with their tapering ends overlapping each other spliced together as it were thus giving more strength and toughness in hardwoods such as hickory and oak the walls of these tubes are very thick as well as dense while in softwoods such as white pine and basswood they are thinner wood cells in the bark are generally longer finer and tougher than those of proper wood and appear more like fibers for example figure 446 represents a cell of the wood of basswood of average length and figure 444 one and part of another of the fibrous bark both drawn to the same scale as these long cells form the principal part of fibrous bark or bast they are named bast cells or bast fibers these give the great toughness and flexibility to the inner bark of basswood i e bast wood and of leather wood and they furnish the invaluable fibres of flax and hemp the proper wood of their stems being tender brittle and destroyed by the processes which separate for the use of tough and slender bast cells in leather wood durka the bast cells are remarkably slender a view of one if magnified on the scale of figure 444 would be a foot and a half long figure 448 magnified bit of a pine shaving taken parallel with the silver grain figure 449 separate whole wood cell more magnified figure 450 same still more magnified both sections represented a discs in section b in face the wood cells of pines and more or less of all other coniferous trees have on two of their sides very peculiar disc-shaped markings by which that kind of wood is recognizable figure 451 and 452 a large and smaller dotted duct from grapevine ducts also called vessels are mostly larger than wood cells indeed some of them as in red oak have caliber large enough to be discerned on a cross-section by the naked eye they make the visible porosity of such kinds of wood this is particularly the case with dotted ducts the surface of which appears as if riddled with round or oval pores such ducts are commonly made up of a row of large cells more or less confluent into a tube scalariform ducts common in ferns and generally angled by mutual pressure in the bundles have transversely elongated thin places parallel with each other giving a ladder-like appearance whence the name annular ducts are marked with cross lines or rings which are thickened portions of the cell wall figures 453 and 454 spiral ducts which uncoil into a single thread figure 455 spiral duct which tears up as a band figure 456 an annular duct with variations above figure 457 loose spiral duct passing into annular figure 458 scalariform ducts of a fern part of a bundle prismatic by pressure figure 459 one torn into a band spiral ducts or vessels have thin walls strengthened by a spiral fiber adherent within this is as delicate and as strong as spider web when uncoiled by pulling apart it tears up and annihilates the cell wall 
the uncoiled threads are seen by gently pulling apart many leaves such as those of amaryllis or the stalks of a strawberry leaflet figure 460 milk vessels of dandelion with cells of the common cellular tissue figure 461 others from the same older and gorged with milky juice all highly magnified laticiferous ducts vessels of the latex or milk vessels are peculiar branching tubes which hold latex or milky juice in certain plants it is very difficult to see them and more so to make out their nature they are peculiar in branching and inosculating so as to make a network of tubes running in among the cellular tissue and they are very small except when gorged and old two cell contents the living contents of young and active cells are mainly protoplasm with water or watery sap which this has imbibed old and effete cells are often empty of solid matter containing only water with whatever may be dissolved in it or air according to the time and circumstances all the various products which plants in general elaborate or which particular plants specially elaborate out of the common food which they derive from the soil and the air are contained in the cells and in the cells they are produced sap is a general name for the principal liquid contents crude sap for that which the plant takes in elaborated sap for what has digested or assimilated they must be undistinguishably mixed in the cells among the solid matters into which cells convert some of their elaborated sap two are general and most important these are chlorophyll and starch chlorophyll meaning leaf green is what gives the green color to herbage it consists of soft grains of rather complex nature partly wax-like partly protoplasmic these abound in the cells of all common leaves and the green rinds of plants wherever exposed to light the green color is seen through the transparent skin of the leaf and the walls of the containing cells chlorophyll is essential to ordinary assimilation in plants by its means under the influence of sunlight the plant converts crude sap into vegetable matter far the largest part of all vegetable matter produced is that which goes to build up the plant's fabric or cellular structure either directly or indirectly there is no one good name for this most important product of vegetation in its final state of cell walls the permanent fabric of herb and shrub and tree it is called cellulose in its most soluble form it is sugar of one or another kind in a less soluble form it is dextrine a kind of liquefied starch in the form of solid grains stored up in the cells it is starch by a series of slight chemical changes mainly a variation in the water entering into the composition one of these forms is converted into another starch farina or facula is the form in which this common plant material is as it were laid by for future use it consists of solid grains somewhat different in form in different plants in size varying from one three hundredth to one four thousandth of an inch partly translucent when wet and of a pearly luster from the concentric lines which commonly appear under the microscope the grains seem to be made up of layer over layer when loose they are commonly oval as in potato starch when much compacted the grains may become angular figure 462 some magnified starch grains in two cells of a potato figure 463 some cells of the albumen or flowery part of indian corn filled with starch grains the starch in a potato was produced in the foliage in the soluble form of dextrine or that of sugar it was conveyed through the cells of the herbage and stalks to a subterranean shoot and there stored up in the tuber when the potato sprouts the starch in the vicinity of developing buds or eyes is changed back again first into mucilaginous dextrine then into sugar dissolved in the sap and in this form it is made to flow to the growing parts where it is laid down into cellulose or cell wall figure 464 four cells from dried onion peel each holding a crystal of different shape one of them twinned figure 465 
some cells from stock of rhubarb plant, three containing chlorophyll, two, one torn across, with raphides. Figure 466. Raphides in a cell from Arasema, with small cells surrounding. Figure 467. Prismatic crystals from the bark of hickory. Figure 468. Glomerate crystal in a cell from beetroot. Figure 469. A few cells of locust bark, a crystal in each. Figure 470. A detached cell with raphides being forced out, as happens when put in water. Besides these cell contents, which are in obvious and essential relation to nutrition, there are others the use of which is problematical. Of such, the commonest are crystals. These, when slender or needle-shaped, are called raphides. They are of inorganic matter, usually of oxalate or phosphate or sulfate of lime. Some, at least of the latter, may be direct crystallizations of what is taken and dissolved in the water absorbed, but others must be the result of some elaboration in the plant. Some plants have hardly any, others abound in them, especially in the foliage and bark. In locust bark, almost every cell holds a crystal, so that in a square inch not thicker than writing paper, there may be over a million and a half of them. When needle-shaped, raphides, as in stalks of calla lily, rhubarb, or four o'clock, they are usually packed in sheaf-like bundles. 3. Anatomy of Roots and Stems this is so nearly the same that an account of the internal structure of stems may serve for the root also. At the beginning, either in the embryo or in incipient shoot from a bud, the whole stem is of tender cellular tissue, or parenchyma, but wood, consisting of wood cells and ducts or vessels, begins to be formed in the earliest growth, and is from the first arranged in two ways, making two general kinds of wood. The difference is obvious even in herbs, but is more conspicuous in the enduring stems of shrubs and trees. On one or the other of these two types, the stems of all phanerogamous plants are constructed. In one, the wood is made up of separate threads, scattered here and there throughout the whole diameter of the stem. In the other, the wood is all collected to form a layer, and a slice across the stem appearing as a ring between a central cellular part, which has none in it, the pith, and an outer cellular part, the bark. Figure 471. Diagram of structure of palm or yucca. Figure 472. Structure of a cornstalk in transverse and longitudinal section. Figure 473. Same of a small palm stem. The dots on the cross sections represent cut ends of the woody bundles or threads an asparagus shoot, and a cornstalk for herbs, and a rattan for a woody kind represent the first kind. To it belongs all plants with monocotyledonous embryo, a beanstalk, and the stem of any common shrub or tree represent the second, and to it belong all plants with dicotyledonous or polycotyledonous embryo. The first has been called, not very properly, endogenous which means inside-growing, the second, properly enough, exogenous, or outside-growing. Endogenous stems, those of monocotyls, attain their greatest size and most characteristic development in palms and dragon trees, therefore chiefly in warm climates, although the palmetto and some yuccas become trees along the southern borders of the United States. In some stems, the woody bundles are more numerous and crowded towards the circumference, and so the harder wood is outside, while in an exogenous stem, the oldest and hardest wood is towards the center. An endogenous stem has no clear distinction of pith, bark, and wood. Concentrically arranged, no silver grain, no annual layers, no bark that peels off clean from the wood. Yet the old stems of yuccas and the like, that continue to increase in diameter, do form a sort of layers and a kind of scaly bark when old. Yuccas show well the curving of woody bundles, which below taper out and are lost at the rind. Figure 474. Short piece of stem of flax, magnified, showing the bark, wood, and pith. 
in a cross section exogenous stems those of dicotyls or of plants coming from dicotyledonous and also polycotyledonous embryos have a structure which is familiar in the wood of our ordinary trees and shrubs it is the same in an herbaceous shoot such as a flax stem as in a maple stem of the first year's growth except that the woody layer is commonly thinner or perhaps reduced to a circle of bundles it was so in the tree stem at the beginning the wood all forms in a cylinder in cross-section or ring around a central cellular part dividing the cellular core within the pith from a cellular bark without as the wood bundles increase in number and in size they press upon each other and become wedge-shaped in the cross-section and they continue to grow from the outside next to the bark so that they become very thin wedges or plates between the plates or wedges are very thin plates in cross-section lines of much compressed cellular tissue which connect the pith with the bark the plan of a one-year-old woody stem of this kind is exhibited in the figures which are essentially diagrams figure 475 diagram of a cross-section of a very young exogenous stem showing six woody bundles or wedges figure 476 same later with wedges increased to 12 figure 477 still later the wedges filling the space separated only by the thin lines or medullary rays running from pith to bark when such a stem grows on from year to year it adds annually a layer of wood outside the preceding one between that and the bark this is exogenous growth or outside growing as the name denotes figure 478 piece of a stem of soft maple of a year old cut crosswise and lengthwise figure 479 a portion of the same magnified figure 480 a small piece of the same taken from one side reaching from the bark to the pith and highly magnified a a small bit of the pith b spiral ducts of what is called the medullary sheath c the wood d d dotted ducts in the wood e e annular ducts f the liber or the inner bark g the green bark h the corky layer i the skin or epidermis j one of the medullary rays or plates of silver grain seen on the cross section some new bark is formed every year as well as new wood the former inside as the latter is outside of that of the year preceding the ring or zone of tender forming tissue between the bark and the wood has been called the cambium layer cambium is an old name of the physiologists for nutritive juice and this thin layer is so gorged with rich nutritive sap when spring growth is renewed that the bark then seems to be loose from the wood and a layer of viscid sap or cambium to be poured out between the two but there is all the while a connection of the bark and wood by delicate cells rapidly multiplying and growing the bark of a year old stem consists of three parts more or less distinct namely beginning next the wood one the liber or fibrous bark the inner bark this contains some wood cells or their equivalent commonly in the form of bast or bast cells such as those of basswood or linden and among herbs those of flax and hemp which are spun and woven or made into cordage it also contains cells which are named sieve cells on account of numerous slits and pores in their walls by which the protoplasm of contiguous cells communicates in woody stems whenever a new layer of wood is formed some new liber or inner bark is also formed outside of it two the green bark or middle bark this consists of cellular tissue only and contains the same green matter chlorophyll as the leaves in woody stems before the season's growth is completed it becomes covered by the corky layer or outer bark the cells of which contain no chlorophyll and are the nature of cork common cork is the thick corky layer of the bark of the cork oak of spain it is this which gives to the stems or twigs of shrubs and trees the aspect and the color peculiar to each 
light gray in the ash purple in the red maple red in several dogwoods etc four the epidermis or skin of the plant consisting of a layer of thick-sided empty cells which may be considered to be the outermost layer or in most herbaceous stems the only layer of cork cells figure 481 magnified view of surface of a bit of young maple wood from which the bark has been torn away showing the wood cells and the bark ends of medullary rays figure 482 section in the opposite direction from bark on the left to beginning of pith on the right and a medullary ray extending from one to the other the green layer of bark seldom grows much after the first season sometimes the corky layer grows and forms new layers inside of the old for years as in the cork oak the sweet gum tree and the white and the paper birch but it all dies after a while and the continual enlargement of the wood within finally stretches it more than it can bear and sooner or later cracks and rends it while the weather acts powerfully upon its surface so the older bark perishes and falls away piecemeal year by year so on old trunks only the inner bark remains this is renewed every year from within and so kept alive while the older and outer layers die are fissured and rent by the distending trunk weathered and worn and thrown off in fragments in some trees slowly so that the bark of old trunks may acquire great thickness in others more rapidly in honeysuckles and grapevines the layers of liber loosen and die when only a year or two old the annual layers of liber are sometimes as distinct as those of the wood, but often not so. The wood of an exogenous trunk, having the old growths covered by the new, remains nearly unchanged in age, except from decay. Wherever there is an annual suspension and renewal of growth, as in temperate climates, the annual growths are more or less distinctly marked, in the form of concentric rings on the cross-section, so that the age of the tree may be known by counting them over twelve hundred layers have been counted on the stumps of sequoias in california and it is probable that some trees now living antedate the christian era the reason why the annual growths are distinguishable is that the wood formed at the beginning of the season is more or less different in the size or character of the cells from that of the close in oak chestnut etc the first wood of the season abounds in dotted ducts the caliber of which is many times greater than that of the proper wood cells sapwood or alburnum is the newer wood living or recently alive and taking part in the conveyance of sap sooner or later each layer as it becomes more and more deeply covered by the newer ones and farther from the region of growth is converted into heartwood or duramen this is drier harder more solid and much more durable as timber than sapwood it is generally of a different color and it exhibits in a different species the hue peculiar to each such as reddish and red cedar brown and black walnut black and ebony etc the change of sapwood into heartwood results from the thickening of the walls of the wood cells by the deposition of hard matter lining the tubes and diminishing their caliber and by the deposition of a vegetable coloring matter peculiar to each species the heartwood being no longer a living part may decay and often does so without the least injury to the tree except by diminishing the strength of the trunk and so rendering it more liable to be overthrown the living parts of a tree of the exogenous kind are only these first the rootlets at one extremity second the buds and leaves of the season at the other and third a zone consisting of the newest wood and the newest bark connecting the rootlets with the buds or leaves however widely separated these may be in the tallest trees from two to four hundred feet apart and these parts of the tree are all renewed every year no wonder therefore that trees may live so long since they annually reproduce everything that is essential to their life and growth and since only a very small part of their bulk is alive at once the tree survives but nothing now living has been so long in it 
as elsewhere life is a transitory thing ever abandoning the old and renewed in the young four anatomy of leaves the wood in leaves is the framework of ribs veins and veinlets serving not only to strengthen them but also to bring in the sap and distribute it throughout every part the cellular portion is the green pulp and is nearly the same as the green layer of the bark so that the leaf may properly enough be regarded as a sort of expansion of the fibrous and green layers of the bark it has no proper corky layer but the whole is covered by a transparent skin or epidermis resembling that of the stem the cells of the leaf are of various forms rarely so compact as to form a close cellular tissue usually loosely arranged at least in the lower part so as to give copious intervening spaces or air passages communicating throughout the whole interior the green color is given by the chlorophyll seen through the very transparent walls of the cell and through the translucent epidermis of the leaf figure 483 magnified section of a leaf of white lily to exhibit the cellular structure both of upper and lower stratum the air passages of the lower and the epidermis or skin in section also a little of that of the lower face with some of its stomates in ordinary leaves having an upper and under surface the green cells form two distinct strata of different arrangement those of the upper stratum are oblong or cylindrical and stand endwise to the surface of the leaf usually close together leaving hardly any vacant spaces those of the lower are commonly irregular in shape most of them with their longer diameter parallel to the face of the leaf and are very loosely arranged leaving many and wide air chambers the green color of the lower is therefore diluted and paler than that of the upper face of the leaf the upper part of the leaf is so constructed as to bear the direct action of the sunshine the lower so as to afford freer circulation of air and to facilitate transpiration it communicates more directly than the upper with the external air by means of stomates the epidermis or skin of leaves and all young shoots is best seen in the foliage it may be readily stripped off from the surface of a lily leaf and still more so from more fleshy and soft leaves such as those of house leek the epidermis is usually composed of a single layer occasionally of two or three layers of empty cells mostly of irregular outline the sinuous lines which traverse it and may be discerned under low powers of the microscope are the boundaries of the epidermal cells figure 484 small portion of epidermis of the lower face of a white lily leaf with stomata figure 485 one of these more magnified in the closed state figure 486 another stoma open figure 487 small portion of epidermis of the garden balsam highly magnified showing very sinuous walled cells and three stomata breathing pores or stomates stomata singular a stoma literally a mouth are openings through the epidermis into the air chambers or intercellular passages always between and guarded by a pair of thin walled guardian cells although most abundant in leaves especially on their lower face that which is screened from direct sunlight they are found on most other green parts they establish a direct communication between the external air and that in the loose interior of the leaf their guardian cells or lips which are soft and delicate like those of the green pulp within by their greater or less turgidity open or close the orifice as the moisture or dryness varies in the white lily the stomata are so remarkably large that they may be seen by a simple microscope of moderate power and may be discerned even by a good hand lens there are about sixty thousand of them to the square inch of the epidermis of the lower face of this lily leaf and only about three thousand to the same space on the upper face it is computed that the average leaf of an apple tree has on its lower face about one hundred thousand of these mouths. End of section eighteen. Recording by Corinne LePage.
Section 19 of The Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corinne LePage. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Section 16 Vegetable Life and Work, Parts 5 to 6. 5 plant food and assimilation only plants are capable of originating organizable matter or the materials which compose the structure of vegetables and animals the essential and peculiar work of plants is to take up portions of earth and air water belonging to both upon which animals cannot live at all and to convert them into something organizable that is into something that under life may be built up into vegetable and animal structures all the food of animals is produced by plants animals live upon vegetables directly or at second hand the carnivorous upon the herbivorous and vegetables live upon earth and air immediately or at second hand the food of plants then primarily is earth and air this is evident enough from the way in which they live many plants will flourish in pure sand or powdered chalk or on the bare face of a rock or wall watered merely with rain and almost any plant may be made to grow from the seed in moist sand and increase its weight many times even if it will not come to perfection many naturally live suspended from branches of trees high in the air and nourished by it alone never having any connection with the soil and some which naturally grow on the ground like the live forever of the gardens when pulled up by the roots and hung in the air will often flourish the whole summer long it is true that fast-growing plants or those which produce much vegetable matter in one season especially in such concentrated form as to be useful as food for man or the higher animals will come to maturity only in an enriched soil but what is a rich soil one which contains decomposing vegetable matter or some decomposing animal matter that is in either case some decomposing organic matter formerly produced by plants aided by this grain bearing and other important vegetables will grow more rapidly and vigorously and make a greater amount of nourishing matter than they could if left to do the whole work at once from the beginning so that in these cases also all the organic or organizable matter was made by plants and made out of earth and air for the larger and most essential part was air and water two kinds of material are taken in and used by plants of which the first although more or less essential to the perfect plant growth are in a certain sense subsidiary if not accidental vis-a-vis -vis earthy constituents those which are left in the form of ashes when a leaf or stick of wood is burned in the open air these consist of some potash or soda in a marine plant some silex the same as flint and a little lime alumine or magnesia iron or manganese sulphur phosphorus etc some or all of these in variable and usually minute proportions they are such materials as happen to be dissolved in small quantity in the water taken up by the roots and when that is consumed by the plant or flies off pure as it largely does by exhalation the earthy matter is left behind in the cells just as it is left encrusting the sides of a tea kettle in which much hard water has been boiled naturally therefore there is more earthy matter i e more ashes in the leaves than in any other part sometimes as much as seven per cent when the wood contains only two per cent because it is through the leaves that most of the water escapes from the plant some of this earthy matter encrusts the cell walls some goes to form crystals or raphides which abound in many plants some enters into certain special vegetable products and some appears to be necessary into the well-being of higher orders of plants although forming no necessary part of the proper vegetable structure the essential constituents of the organic fabric are those which are dissipated into air and vapor in complete burning they make up from eighty eight to ninety nine per cent of the leaf or stem and essentially the whole both of the cellulose of the walls 
and the protoplasm of the contents. Burning gives these materials of the plant's structure back to the air, mainly in the same condition in which the plant took them, the same condition which is reached more slowly in natural decay. The chemical elements of the cell walls, or cellulose, as also of starch, sugar, and all that class of organizable cell material, are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The same, with nitrogen, are the constituents of protoplasm, or the truly vital part of vegetation. These chemical elements, out of which organic matters are composed, are supplied to the plant by water, carbonic acid, and some combinations of nitrogen. Water, far more largely than anything else, is imbibed by the roots, also more or less by the foliage in the form of vapor. Water consists of oxygen and hydrogen, and cellulose, or plant wall, starch, sugar, etc., however different in their qualities, agree in containing these two elements in the same relative proportions as in water. Carbonic acid gas, carbon dioxide, is one of the components of the atmosphere. A small one, ordinarily only about one twenty-five hundredth of its bulk, sufficient for the supply of vegetation, but not enough to be injurious to animals, as it would be if accumulated. Every current or breeze of air brings to the leaves expanded in it a succession of fresh atoms of carbonic acid, which it absorbs through its multitudinous breathing pores. This gas is also taken up by water. So it is brought to the ground by rain and it is absorbed by the roots of the plants, either as dissolved in the water they imbibe, or in the form of gas in the interstices of the soil. Manured ground, that is, soil containing decomposing vegetable or animal matters, is constantly giving out this gas into the interstices of the soil, whence the roots of the growing crop absorb it. Carbonic acid thus supplied, primarily from the air, is the source of the carbon which forms much the largest part of the substance of every plant. The proportion of carbon may be roughly estimated by charring some wood or foliage, that is, by heating it out of contact with the air, so as to decompose and drive off all the other constituents of the fabric, leaving the large bulk of charcoal or carbon behind. Nitrogen, the remaining plant element, is a gas which makes up more than two-thirds of the atmosphere, is brought into the foliage and also to the roots, being moderately soluble in water, in the same ways as is carbonic acid. The nitrogen, which, mixed with oxygen, a little carbonic acid and vapor of water, constitutes the air we breathe, is the source of this fourth plant element. But it is very doubtful if ordinary plants can use any nitrogen gas directly as food, that is, if they can directly cause it to combine with the other elements so as to form protoplasm. But when combined with hydrogen, forming ammonia, or when combined with oxygen, nitric acid and nitrates, plants appropriate it with avidity, and several natural processes are going on in which nitrogen of the air is also combined and supplied to the soil in forms directly available to the plant. The most efficient is nitrification, the formation of nitre, nitrate of potash, in the soil, especially in all fertile soils, through the action of a bacterial ferment. Assimilation in plants is the conversion of these inorganic substances, essentially water, carbonic acid, and some form of combined or combinable nitrogen, into vegetable matter. This most dilute food the living plant concentrates and assimilates to itself. Only plants are capable of converting these mineral into organizable matters, and this all-important work is done by them, so far as all ordinary vegetation is concerned, only under the light of the sun, acting upon green parts or foliage, that is, upon chlorophyll, or upon what answers to chlorophyll, which these parts contain. The sun, in some way, supplies a power which enables the living plant to originate these peculiar chemical combinations, to organize matter into forms which are alone capable of being endowed with life. The proof of this proposition is simple, and it shows at the same time, in the simplest way, what a plant does with water and carbonic acid it consumes. Namely, first, it is only in sunshine or bright daylight 
that the green parts of plants give out oxygen gas than they regularly do so and second the giving out of this oxygen gas is required to render the chemical composition of water and carbonic acid the same as that of cellulose that is of the plant's permanent fabric this shows why plants spread out so large a surface of foliage leaves are so many workshops full of machinery worked by sun power the emission of oxygen gas from any sunlit foliage is seen by placing some of this under water or by using an aquatic plant by collecting the air bubbles which rise and by noting that a taper burns brighter in this air or a leafy plant in a glass globe may be supplied with a certain small percentage of carbonic acid gas and after proper exposure to sunshine the air on being tested will be found to contain less carbonic acid and just so much the more oxygen gas now if the plant is making cellulose or any equivalent substance that is is making the very materials of its fabric and growth as must generally be the case all this oxygen gas given off by the leaves comes from the decomposition of carbonic acid taken in by the plant for cellulose and also starch dextrine sugar and the like are composed of carbon along with oxygen and hydrogen in just the proportions to form water and the carbonic acid and water taken in less the oxygen which the carbon brought with it as carbonic acid and which is given off from the foliage in sunshine just represents the manufactured article cellulose it comes to the same if the first product of assimilation is sugar or dextrine which is a sort of soluble starch or starch itself and in the plant all these forms are readily changed into one another in the tiny seedling as fast as this assimilated matter is formed it is used in growth that is in the formation of cell walls after a time some or much of the product may be accumulated in store for future growth as in the root of the turnip or the tuber of the potato or the seed of corn or pulse this store is mainly in the form of starch when growth begins anew this starch is turned into dextrine or into sugar in liquid form and used to nourish and build up the germinating embryo or the new shoot where it is at length converted into cellulose and used to build up plant structure but that which builds plant fabric is not the cellular structure itself the work is done by the living protoplasm which dwells within the walls this also has to take and to assimilate its proper food for its own maintenance and growth protoplasm assimilates along with the other three elements the nitrogen of the plant's food this comes primarily from the vast stock in the atmosphere but mainly through the earth where it is accumulated through various processes in a fertile soil mainly so far as concerns crops from the decomposition of former vegetables and animals this protoplasm which is formed at the same time as the simpler cellulose is essentially the same as the flesh of animals and the source of it it is the common basis of vegetable and animal life so plant assimilation produces all the food and fabric of animals starch sugar the oils which are as it were these farinaceous matters more deoxidated chlorophyll and the like and even cellulose itself form the food of herbivorous animals and much of the food of man when digested they enter into the blood undergo various transformations and are at length decomposed into carbonic acid and water and exhaled from the lungs in respiration in other words are given back to the air by the animal as the very same materials which the plant took from the air as its food are given back to the air in the same form that they would have taken if the vegetable matter had been left to decay where it grew or if it had been set on fire and burned and with the same result too as to the heat the heat in this case producing and maintaining the proper temperature of the animal the protoplasm and other products containing nitrogen gluten legumine etc and which are most accumulated in grains and seeds for the nourishment of their embryos when they germinate compose the most nutritious vegetable food consumed by animals they form their proper flesh and sinews 
while the earthy constituents of the plant form the earthy matter of the bones etc at length decomposed in the secretions and exertions these nitrogenous constituents are through successive changes finally resolved into mineral matter into carbonic acid water and ammonia or some nitrates into exactly or essentially the same materials which the plants took up and assimilated animals depend on vegetables absolutely and directly for their subsistence also indirectly because plants purify the air for animals in the very process by which they create food they take from the air carbonic acid gas injurious to animals respiration which is continually poured into it by the breathing of all animals by all decay by the burning of fuel and all other ordinary combustion and they restore an equal bulk of life-sustaining oxygen needful for the respiration of animals needful also in a certain measure for plants in any work they do for in plants as well as in animals work is done at a certain cost six plant work and movement as the organic basis and truly living material of plants is identical with that of animals so is the life at bottom essentially the same but in animals something is added at every rise from the lowest to the highest organisms action and work in living beings require movement living things move those not living are only moved plants move as truly as do animals the latter nourished as they are upon organized food which has been prepared for them by plants and is found only here and there must needs have the power of going after it of collecting it or at least of taking it in which requires them to make spontaneous movements but ordinary plants with their widespread surface always in contact with the earth and air on which they feed the latter everywhere the same and the former very much so might be thought to have no need of movement ordinary plants indeed have no locomotion some float but most are rooted to the spot where they grew yet probably all of them execute various movements which must be as truly self-caused as are those of the lower grades of animals movements which are overlooked only because too slow to be directly observed nevertheless the motion of the hour hand and of the minute hand of a watch is not less real than that of the second hand figure 488 two individuals of an oscillaria magnified locomotion moreover many microscopic plants living in water are seen to move freely if not briskly under the microscope and so likewise do more conspicuous aquatic plants in their embryo-like or seedling state even at maturity species of oscillaria such as in figures 488 minute worm-shaped plants of fresh waters taking this name from their oscillating motions freely execute three different kinds of movement the very delicate investing coat of cellulose not impeding the action of the living protoplasm within even when this coat is firmer and hardened with a siliceous deposit such crescent-shaped or boat-shaped one-celled plants as clostarium or nericula are able in some way to move along from place to place in the water figure 489 a few cells of a leaf of niaeus flexilis highly magnified the arrows indicate the courses of the circulating currents movements in cells or cell circulation sometimes called cyclosis has been detected in so many plants especially in comparatively transparent aquatic plants and in hairs on the surface of land plants where it is easiest to observe that it may be inferred to take place in all cells during the most active part of their life this motion is commonly a streaming movement of threads of protoplasm carrying along solid granules by which the action may be observed and the rate measured or in some cases it is a rotation of the whole protoplasmic contents of the cell a comparatively low magnifying power will show it in the cells of nitella and chara which are cryptogamous plants and under a moderate power it is well seen in the tape grass of fresh water valisneria and in niaeus flexilis minute particles and larger greenish globules are seen to be carried along as if in a current around the cell passing up one side across the end down the other and across the bottom 
completing the circuit sometimes within a minute or less when well warmed. To see it well in the cell, which, like a string of beads, form the hairs on the stamens of spiderwort, a high magnifying power is needed. Transference of liquid from cell to cell, and so from place to place in the plant, the absorption of water by the rootless, and the exhalation of the greater part of it from the foliage, these and similar operations are governed by the physical laws which regulate the diffusion of fluids, but are controlled by the action of living protoplasm. Equally, under vital control, are the various chemical transformations which attend assimilation and growth, and which involve not only molecular movements, but conveyance. Growth itself, which is the formation and shaping of new parts, implies the direction of internal activities to definite ends. Movements of Organs The living protoplasm, in all but the lowest grade of plants, is enclosed and to common appearance isolated in separate cells, the walls of which can only in their earliest state be said to be alive. Still plants are able to cause the protoplasm of adjacent cells to act in concert, and by their combined action to affect movements in roots, stems, or leaves, some of them very slow and gradual, some manifest and striking. Such movements are brought about through individually minute changes in the form or tension in the protoplasm of the innumerable cells which make up the structure of the organ. Some of the slower movements are effected during growth and may be explained by inequality of growth on the two sides of the bending organ. But the more rapid changes of position, and some of the slow ones, cannot be so explained. Root Movements In its growth, a root turns or bends away from the light and towards the center of the earth, so that in lengthening it bears itself in the soil where it is to live and act. Every one must have observed this in the germination of seeds. Careful observations have shown that the tip of a growing root also makes little sweeps or short movements from side to side. By this means it more readily insinuates itself into yielding portions of the soil. The root tips will also turn towards moisture and so secure the most favorable positions in the soil. Stem Movements the root end of the collicle, or first joint of the stem, that below the cotyledons, acts like the root, in turning downward in germination, making a complete bend to do so if it happens to point upward as the seed lies on the ground, while the other end turns or points skyward. These opposite positions are taken in complete darkness as readily as in the light, in dryness as much as in moisture. Therefore, so far as these movements are physical, the two portions of the same internode appear to be oppositely affected by gravitation or other influences. Rising into the air, the stem and green shoots generally, while young and pliable, bend or direct themselves toward the light, or toward the stronger light when unequally illuminated, while roots turn towards the darkness. Many growing stems have also a movement in nutation that is, of nodding successively in different directions. This is brought about by a temporary increase of turgidity of the cells along one side, thus bowing the stem over to the opposite side, and this line of turgescence travels round the shoot continually, from right to left, or from left to right, according to the species. Thus the shoot bends to all points of the compass in succession. Commonly, this nutation is slight or hardly observable, it is most marked in twining stems. The growing upper end of such stems, as is familiar in the hop, pole beans, and morning glory, turns over in an inclined or horizontal direction, thus stretching out to reach a neighboring support, and by the continual change in the direction of the nodding, sweeps the whole circle, and sweeps being the longer as the stem lengthens. When it strikes against a support, such as a stem or branch of a neighboring plant, the motion is arrested at the contact, but continues at the growing apex beyond, and this apex is thus made to wind spirally around the supporting body. Leaf movements are all but universal. The presentation by most leaves of their upper surface to the light, from whatever direction that may come, is an instance, for when they turn upside down, they twist or bend around the stalk to recover this normal position. Leaves, 
and the leaflets of compound leaves change this position at nightfall or when the light is withdrawn they then take what is called their sleeping posture resuming the diurnal position when daylight returns this is very striking in locust trees in the sensitive plant and the wood sorrel young seedlings droop or close their leaves at night in plants which are not thus affected in the adult foliage all this is thought to be a protection against the cold by nocturnal radiation various plants climb by a coiling movement of their leaves or their leaf stalks familiar examples are seen in clematis morandia tropielum and in solanum which is much cultivated in greenhouses in the latter and in other woody plants which climb in this way the petioles thicken and harden after they have grasped their support thus securing a very firm hold tendril movements tendrils are either leaves or stems specially developed for climbing purposes cobea is a good example of partial transformation some of the leaflets are normal some of the same leaf are little tendrils and some intermediate in character the passion flowers give good examples of simple stem tendrils grapevines of branched ones most tendrils make revolving sweeps like those of twining stems those of some passion flowers in sultry weather are apt to move fast enough for the movement actually to be seen for a part of the circuit as plainly as that of the second-hand watch two herbaceous species passiflora gracilis and p sequoides the first an annual the second a strong-rooted perennial of the easiest cultivation are admirable for illustration both of revolving movements and of sensitive coiling figure 490 piece of stem of sensitive plant mimosa paduca with two leaves the lower open the upper in the closed state movements under irritation the most familiar case is that of the sensitive plant the leaves suddenly take their nocturnal position when roughly touched or when shocked by a jar the leaflets close in pairs the four outspread in partial petioles come closer together and the common petiole is depressed the seat of the movements is at the base of the leaf stalk and stalklets shrunkia a near relative of the sensitive plant acts in the same way but is slower these are not anomalous actions but only extreme manifestations of a faculty more or less common in foliage in locust and honey locust for example repeated jars will slowly produce similar effects leaf stalks and tendrils are adapted to their uses in climbing by a similar sensitiveness the coiling of the leaf stalk is in response to a kind of irritation produced by contact with the supporting body this may be shown by gentle rubbing or prolonged pressure upon the upper face of the leaf stalk which is soon followed by a curvature tendrils are still more sensitive to the contact or light friction this causes the free end of the tendril to coil around the support and the sensitiveness propagated downward along the tendril causes that side of it to become less turgescent or the opposite side more so thus throwing the tendril into coils this shortening draws the plant up to the support tendrils which have not laid hold will at length commonly coil spontaneously in a simple coil from the free apex downward in sicyos echinocytis and the above-mentioned passion flowers the tendril is so sensitive under a higher summer temperature that it will curve and coil promptly after one or two light strokes by the hand figure 491 portion of stem and leaves of the telegraph plant desmodium gyrans almost of natural size among spontaneous movements the most singular are those of desmodium gyrans of india sometimes called telegraph plant which is cultivated on account of its action of its three leaflets the larger terminal one moves only by drooping at nightfall and rising with the dawn but its two small lateral leaflets when in a congenial high temperature by day and night move upward and downward in a succession of jerks stopping occasionally as if to recover from exhaustion in most plant movements some obviously useful purpose is subserved this of desmodium gyrans is a riddle 
Movement in flowers are very various. The most remarkable are in some way connected with fertilization. Some occur under irritation. The stamens of barberry start forward when touched at the base inside. Those of many polyandrous flowers, of sparmenia very strikingly, spread outwardly when lightly brushed. The two lips or lobes of the stigma in mimulus close after a touch. Some are automatic and are connected with dichogamy. The style of sabbatia and of large flowered species of epilobium bends over strongly to one side or turns downward when the blossom opens, but slowly erects itself a day or two later. Extraordinary movements connected with capture of insects. The most striking cases are those of Drosera and Dionea, for an account of which see how plants behave and Goodale's physiological botany. The upper face of leaves and of common species of Drosera, or sundew, is beset with stout bristles, having a glandular tip. This tip secretes a drop of a clear but very viscid liquid, which glistens like a dewdrop in the sun, whence the popular name. When a fly or other small insect attracted by the liquid alights itself upon the leaf, the viscid drops are so tenacious that they hold it fast. In struggling, it only becomes more completely entangled. Now the neighboring bristles, which have not been touched, slowly bend inward from all sides toward the captured insect, and bring their sticky apex upon its body, thus increasing the number of bonds. Moreover, the blade of the leaf commonly aids in the capture by becoming concave, its sides or edges turning inward, which brings still more of the gland-tipped bristles into contact with the captive's body. The insect perishes. The clear liquid disappears, apparently by absorption into the tissue of the leaf. It is thought that the absorbed secretion takes with it some of the juices of the insect or the products of its decomposition. Figure 492. Plant of Dionea muscipula or Venus's fly trap, reduced in size. Dionea muscipula, the most remarkable vegetable fly trap, is related to the sundews and has a more special and active apparatus for fly catching. Formed of the summit of the leaf, the two halves of this rounded body move as if they were hinged upon the midrib. Their edges are fringed with spiny but not glandular bristles, which interlock when the organ closes. Upon the face are two or three short and delicate bristles, which are sensitive. They do not themselves move when touched, but they propagate the sensitiveness to the organ itself, causing it to close with a quick movement. In a fresh and vigorous leaf, under a high summer temperature, and when the trap lies widely open, a touch of any one of the minute bristles on the face, by the finger or any extraneous body, springs the trap so to say, and it closes suddenly, but after an hour or so it opens again. When a fly or other small insect alights on the trap, it closes in the same manner, and so quickly that the intercrossing marginal bristles obstruct the egress of the insect, unless it be a small one and not worth taking. Afterwards, and more slowly, it completely closes and presses down upon the prey. Then some hidden glands pour out a glary liquid which dissolves out the juices of the insect's body next all is reabsorbed into the plant and the trap opens to repeat the operation but the same leaf perhaps never captures more than two or three insects it ages instead becomes more rigid and motionless or decays away that some few plants should thus take animal food will appear less surprising when it is considered that hosts of plants of the lower grade, known as fungi, molds, rusts, ferments, bacteria, etc., live upon animal or other organized matter, either decaying or living. That plants should execute movements in order to accomplish the ends of their existence is less surprising now, when it is known that the living substance of plants and animals is essentially the same. That the beings of both kingdoms partake of a common life, to which, as they rise in the scale, other and higher endowments are successively superadded. Work uses up material and energy in plants 
as well as in animals the latter live and work by the consumption and decomposition of that which plants have assimilated into organizable matter through an energy derived from the sun and which is so to say stored up in the assimilated products in every internal action as well as in every movement and exertion some portion of this assimilated matter is transformed and of its stored energy expended the steam engine is an organism for converting the sun's radiant energy stored up by plants in the fuel into mechanical work an animal is an engine fed by vegetable fuel in the same or other forms from the same source by the decomposition of which it also does mechanical work the plant is the producer of food and accumulator of solar energy or force but the plant like the animal is a consumer whenever and by so much as it does any work except its great work of assimilation every internal change and movement every transformation such as that of starch into sugar and of sugar into cell walls as well as every movement of parts which becomes extremely visible is done at the expanse of a certain amount of its assimilated matter and of its stored energy that is by the decomposition or combustion of sugar or some such product into carbonic acid and water which is given back to the air just as in the animal it is given back to the air in respiration so the respiration of plants is as real and as essential as that of animals but what plants consume or decompose in their life and action is of insignificant amount in comparison with what they compose end of section 19 recording by corinne lepage